Uh, my name is Jules. I'm a developer advocate, the lead developer advocate for Anyscale. Anyscale is the company that manages the um, uh, uh, managed service of Ray. How many of people have actually heard about Ray? Well, you guys can leave then, if you have. But no, um, like I said, I, I, before I, before I uh, joined Anyscale, I was at Databricks for about six years. So I was doing the same thing over there in terms of uh, uh, scaling uh, uh, um, uh, data at scale. And today's talk is about, Ray, how do you actually scale your machine learning applications? We have sort of entered the zeitgeist of L, uh, for ML, and what does it actually mean to scale your AI application? So today's agenda, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at 20,000 feet, and we're going to go down to uh, 10,000 feet, and we're going to go down to zero feet above the sea level. We're going to look at some code and look at some, 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 some demo. And what I really want to say is, why Ray? You know, why, why Ray today is actually important? Why do we actually need another distributed system? And then I'll go in, get into the Ray architecture, how actually the internal components work, and then get into the design patterns that Ray provides you to write distributed frameworks uh, uh, for data scientists and ML. And then we'll look at one of the libraries that you actually use very often if you're a data scientist or if you're a machine learning uh, developer. You need to train data, you need to tune your data, you need to do hypergrammed optimization. And there are native libraries built on top of that. And then I'll give a demo of, of how you actually see using the Exibuts Ray. Given the time, I don't think I'll get a chance to get into the Exibut Ray, but um, um, I'll have office hours. You can come in and ask me any questions you might actually have. Okay, so why Ray? So before we actually get into you know, what Ray is all about, I think the original creators of Ray, who were uh, uh, PhD students uh, guided by Jan Stoika at Rice Lab, those of you actually heard about Rice Lab, Rice Lab was the uh, successor to Amp Lab, where Spark was born and Mesos was born and, and Cafe was born. And Rice Lab was the 10 years after that, this new, new emergence of, of distributed computing. And the creators of this particular project were looking at the industry's trends, what was actually happening now, what's the next big thing that actually gonna happen? And they realized there were three fundamental trends or factors that really affected it. One was that we have sort of entered, if I could uh, use the metaphor uh, without being hyperbolic about it, is that we have entered the zeitgeist of ML, right? ML is very pervasive in almost every application. Today you see almost everybody is actually talking about ML, from the industry and the finance to the automotives, the manufacturing to robotics, ML is everywhere. So it's very, very prevalent. And one of the things that actually had led to the prevalence is that these machine learning models, or these machine learning um, uh, models which are being produced or, or developed require a very high intensive, compute intensity demand. Mm -hmm. And so the second trend was that as a result of this, the distributed computing used to be an exception before, right? Those of you actually 10 years ago uh, were looking at distributed computing, it was an exception, only few people actually used it. Today, it's actually becoming a norm. It's going to be a necessity because of this pervasiveness mm -hmm. that we actually see. And the result of, of this is that we actually have a need to have this, you know, compute intensive ML programs which are being, you know, which are being deployed in, this, in, in these industries. And if you look at the particular trend from 2000 all the way up to currently where we have very large uh, GPT models being deployed, they actually require a fair amount of compute intensive. And the problem is that the CPUs and the GPUs that we actually produce cannot really meet the demand, right? So the only way we can actually do things is to actually go uh, completely horizontally, we have to actually distribute gaps. The gap is not is is not being filled because of these um, uh, systems actually require a fair amount of compute intensive, and the current hardware, uh, specialized hardware, don't even meet that. So the only way you can actually do is compute horizontally. So that's sort of the second trend that actually led to this emergence of of the distributed computing becoming a necessity and not a norm. And then if you look at the the third one, uh, those of you who can attest to that distributed computing is not easy, or if you're actually building systems, it's not very easy to program nor to actually build them. And the reason is that there are some trade-offs when you actually think about uh, how you actually build these systems, right? No presentation is, is valid without having this two-dimensional lens where you look at one thing or the left thing, you look at one thing with x-axis. But if you look at the existing solutions, they exist. People actually work and work on distributed systems. They build distributed systems. They deploy, they manage, and monitor it. And if you actually look at the middle part, people use this in terms of building this distributed system where they actually pick up discrete parts. You know, you have 
for streaming, they might use you, uh, um, a Spark, they might use Flink for data processing, you might use another tool. The problem with that is that these are disparate bespoke tools, right? They have different communication protocols, they have used different languages. So stringing them together actually can be a, quite a cumbersome task. And then if you actually look at the far right, you have, you know, you do yourself thing whereby, um, you know, not invented syndrome, you have really experts who say, well, we're just going to use Docker, we're just going to, you know, slap over things together. Now, unless you're a large enterprise and you have, a, you know, deep pockets, you might not be able to actually use that. So it's very general, right? But it's very difficult to, to maintain and, and to, to, to manage it because of the fact that you actually need very deep, deep expertise. And then if you go to the um, far left, which is most the easiest one up on the high scale, it's very, it's, you know, it's very easy to use. You know, all you, all you worry about is you don't have to worry about managing clusters. It's completely serverless. You write your big query or you write your Lambda function and you just submit it to the, uh, to the cluster and let the cluster manager deal with the resources and let the cluster manager scale up and scale down. The problem there, obviously, is that there's some trade-offs, right? You might be beholden to the, the, the compute time that, that you're allowed to actually run with it. Uh, you might not have the persistency that you might actually require when you're actually uh, running some serverless uh, Lambda function or a query that you might require in your subsequent state. So there's no state being mentioned. Uh, you might be beholden to the fact that some of the hardware is not available for you. So you are sort of, you know, um, uh, beholden to the, to the, to the, uh, the, uh, the computer uh, uh, cloud provider giving you only hardware. So all these are, you know, different kinds of trade-offs and you just have to figure out, you know, which one you actually use. They all work. They all actually have merits and trade-offs. So what we're thinking <clears throat> when this creator's array came along, they said, well, what we can do is I think we have a solution that we can ad address these things. And one thing we can actually do is that if you look at, this guy did that. If you look at Ray, Ray is a way for you to actually run your system anyway. You can actually run it on any of the cloud providers. Um, at the bottom, bottom, you can actually run your laptop. You can run it on your um, um, uh, on any of the, uh, the cloud providers, or your laptop, or on premise. And then the second layer, if you actually look at this as a layered cake of cap capability and functionality, you have the Ray Core. And the Ray Core is really I lost this. The Ray Core is really your your uh, fundamental your fundamental abstraction that allows you to distribute your 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 primitives. And the Ray Core APIs are the one that actually give you this abstraction to do the distributed computing. And one thing, if I can't get away anything you actually want to walk away with, that this is the ethos and that's the premise of Ray APIs. We provide you the Ray API abstractions so which you can actually build distributed systems and let Ray infrastructure deal with the compute resources, let it deal with the elasticity, let it deal with the performance, let it deal with the, the, the full tolerance. And if you actually go one level above, you have the what we call the core libraries, which are built using these core primitives. And then the integration libraries, which are all the common ML libraries that you actually want to use that actually work on Ray. And if you are a distributed framework um, a programmer who actually wants to write your own distributed framework, that comes on the far right, right? So you can actually build, use these primitives to build that. So that's sort of at a very high level. That's what, that's what Ray is all about. And if you look at the native libraries, these are the libraries that, I, that we actually provide that run on top of the Ray that allow you to scale your machine learning, right? So if you actually want to do huge amount of data processing, you can actually use Modern. By the way, Devin is going to be giving a talk uh, this evening. He's the creator of Modern running on Ray. Uh, so attend this talk if you actually find out how you can actually do Pandas on a distributed scale. Uh, if you actually want to do training, you can use distributed training using Ray Train. And if you actually want to use serve, you can use Ray serving and so on and so forth. And if you are the guy who actually is building models and you need to do your, your hyperparameter tuning, you can actually use Tune and Optuna with that. And then if you are into reinforcement learning, that's another library that actually provides. So we actually provide you these native libraries for you to be able to actually do that. And then finally, you know, who's actually using this? These are all the different companies who are actually using Ray at a massive scale. And all these companies use it for different purposes, right? They, 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 they use it for um, um, uh, data processing. They use it for all different things. And our approach is that you can actually take your Python programs that you actually have. You can take your Python functions that you have. You can take your Python classes that you actually have. And then scale it using these APIs to run it on the cluster. And that sort of is Ray's approach. 
So what I'm going to do now is drip, drop down a little bit to the, the architecture and what, what Ray is all about. And if you look at um, the component of distributed system, this is no different from any distributed system that you actually looked at, right? You actually have the worker nodes, you have the, the head node that actually has a driver program. And the unique thing about Ray, which is distinguishing feature, is that you have this distributed scheduler. Right, if you look at other distributed systems, they have central place, which is the bottleneck that actually arranges and creates your DAG and then uh, furnishes or, or, or hashes out the, the task. Over here, you have a distributed scheduler and then you have a distributed store that, that has a sh keeps a shared memory of all the objects that you actually create in your task, which are, which are crossed across. And that's sort of the fundamental distribution factor of Ray, which is actually different from, from anything else. And then if you go one level below, this is where Ray actually distinguishes itself. You got all these different components that do different things. The worker is the one that actually might uh, uh, run your task. Each worker is associated a bound to a core. And so if you have 12 cores on the machine, you actually can use 12 cores. Uh, you have the Raylet, which is the massive distributed scheduler, and that talks to all the other Ray resources to figure out what, what resources, have, how many GPUs do I have, how many CPUs do I have. And based on that, I'll schedule a task to be run on that. It reports all the metadata it actually has and what tasks it's running on, on in the global store, which is the central place where all the metadata is kept. So each and every Raylet within a certain amount of time T knows exactly who is running what and what resources are available so I can actually make my intelligent scheduling policies. So that's sort of the, the central place what's actually happening behind the scenes. And now if I go one level below, as I, as I say, one of the fundamental principles of Ray was to provide you with this, what I call design patterns of core primitive APIs. So you can actually build this distributed system. You can take this abstraction, then convert them into a distributed setting, so you can actually do that. You can think of Ray as a framework for building other distributed frameworks. So <clears throat> design patterns are not something new uh, to us. Design patterns are not something new. Uh, those were sort of introduced earlier by the Gang of Four in a book uh, that actually told us all about design patterns. And those of you who are software engineers here know what design patterns are. They are like guardrails, they are like guidelines for you to use the constructs in the language in a particular manner. So, you know, Python has iterators and coroutines and, and singletons and so on and so forth. And so, Ray, we provide you these design patterns that take your Ray tasks or, or you take your Python functions and then convert them into a parallel task. Or we actually also have what we call Ray objects. So any of your tasks that actually create an object, we convert them into, into uh, a distributed object, which I then return you as a feature. So we can actually run these very asynchronously. And then you have the stateful actors, which those of you who are familiar with uh, Arlang or, or, or Akka, uh, give you the ability to have stateful microservices which actually run. And then <clears throat> if you take this particular pattern, this is all it actually does. Function gets converted into a task, which is scheduled on, a, on, on any particular node. A class can be converted into a stateful actor, which is then deployed in a particular node as a stateful service to which you can actually talk. And then the distributed object is an immutable object shared across the entire cluster. And any task which is running that needs that particular object can access it at any time. And these objects are really futures. So how does it actually translate it into code? So if you actually have a function over here, we actually have a read array uh, that actually just takes a file uh, and then returns you a numpy array. And then you have another function called uh, add that takes two numpy arrays and adds them. Uh, all, you have to con all you have to do to convert them into a distributed setting for, for, for Ray to use is that you use the decorator, right? So if you use Ray.remote, now this is going to be converted into a task. Um, if you use, for example, your class, extra class that you actually have, I can just decorate that with radar remote and that converts that into, 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 into a stateful service. And I can provide at the time of the declaration whether I want to use GPUs or whether I want to use CPUs or how many resources that need or how much memory that, that particular stateful service would require. And in, in running them, all you have to do is use the remote um, um, dot function and then supply the file name and it's going to be scheduled to actually run. The same thing with the actor, if you actually want to create an instance of that actor, you just say counter.remote and it actually returns that. And then last time, if you actually want to uh, get the value of the particular future, you can actually see that what this read.array does just returns your feature right away, right? 
And so this is actually what happens in, in, in real time, is that when you invoke uh, read that array, it gets scheduled on node array. It creates a graph over there. The second one is going to be on the second node. Uh, that's going to compute and read the array. And it's going to return you an entire array. All it returns you is a future, right? It just returns you an ID. Uh, and it creates this DAS dynamically, so it's, it's executed eagerly. And when you do add remote, now those two um, uh, uh, futures are going to be sent to this particular add function. And it will figure out that I might need to get those ID, uh, arrays, add them together, and then return you back with the array.get. And array.get is a blocking function that says, OK, I'm going to wait for these tasks to finish. Or they've already been finished, and I'll just return you the value. So this is what actually array task actually does. There is also this notion of distributed object store. And the distributed object store is, 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 is the plasma object store, which is the Apache error tables, which runs on each and every store. So each and every worker has, or each and every node has a shared memory. And if you actually have workers running on those particular processes, they have access to that to zero copy. So there's not that much of data being transferred as, as IPC. You got all these worker slots processes which are running, and they're accessing all the data that, that the tasks actually created on that particular object store. If the object store runs off memory, you put it on, on, on and spill it over the disk. So that's sort of the distributed object store and how it actually works. Uh, take this particular instance. I have node 1a that I'm executing a function called f. It's going to return a value x, whatever that x is. But x is not return. What's actually return is a future, right, or where x might be computed. And x is actually stored in its shared memory. Then I have a function called uh, g, which I'm not sending the value of x, but I'm sending what was returned by the invocation of remote function. And now I'm actually sending f. Now, because of the local locality, f is going to be scheduled not on, on another node, but it's going to be scheduled on the same node where the data resides. So I don't have to transfer that particular data. right? So there is some node uh, locality awareness available for my g to be scheduled to run over there so I actually can get the data. So that's what. That's what a G is going to do. G is going to be scheduled over there, and I'll have the data accessible straight from X, and I'll return it back. OK. So that's sort of you know, the code level. Now, what I want to talk about now is the ecosystem, right? Now, if you are a data scientist, or if you're a machine learning program, there are three fundamental workloads that you are iteratively going to do in developing your, your model. One is you're going to be training the model. And the second, then, you're going to be tuning the model. And third, you're going to be either serving or inferencing. And Raytune is one of the libraries which is very common, it's very popular for you to actually scale and do your hyperparameter tuning. And so what is Tune? Um, Tune is really a very efficient um, machine learning library that supports state-of-the-art uh, search algorithms that you actually have. Um, it is effective because it's running on Ray. So if you're actually creating a lot of trials, if you're creating um, uh, a lot of hyperparameter tuning, you can actually distribute those trials across. And that way, you don't have to sort of worry about running this on a single node. You're running it on, on either one machine, or you can actually distribute across it. And it is, it is quite safe, because we actually keep track of all the trails and all the checkpoints that you actually need. And as I said, it actually supports, what's wrong with the slides? Um, you can actually run this on a single node and use all the cores available, or you can actually schedule it on multiple nodes that actually has multiple cores. And I think there's some slides I can bring over here that actually shows the, the distribution of how it actually works. But that's essentially what it is. And OK. Um, so if you, if, if you look at this particular slide, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to show over here is that the, 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 the search algorithms that Ray actually supports that you can actually plug into your Ray Tune to say, these are the search algorithms I want to use of Tuna, or I want to use grid search, or I want to use something else. Uh, if I want to use schedulers, I can use Asha, or I can use VH4, or I can use any of these very smart state-of-the-art schedulers to figure out how am I going to do the next trial. So that's what sort of Ray Tune allows you to do. And for those of you who are not familiar or new, you know, what are hyperparameters? And hyperparameters are parameters that you actually use to influence how the modal parameters are going to be used. And the modal parameters are the ones that are going to be learned during the training. So an example of a modal parameter would be, say, uh, in a network environment, would be bias or, or, or the, um, the, the, the 
weights. Uh, in a regression model, might be coefficients and the constant. And the hyperparameters are the one that actually detect uh, how your, your, your model is going to look like. And they are normally set before you actually start doing the tuning and before the, the, the model starts learning or the algorithm or your, or your training function or your objective function, whatever the function that you do, to create the loss or whatever metric that you're trying to compute. And that's sort of the distinguishing characteristics. And here's another example of, of, of your, what your hyperparameter look like. Uh, the network diagram would be one of them. Uh, again, I'm missing a picture over there, where your 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 condensed layer, or your number of filters, or your number of uh, max pool layer, all these are hyperparameter tunings that you can actually use to figure out what is going to be the most optimal structure for your network, right? And so these are the the hyperparameters. Now, when you have a large hyperparameter space, uh, it does get expensive, right? It does get expensive because now you actually have to compute over a large uh, uh, amount of hyperparameter space. Uh, it's time consuming because you know if you have a large space, what do you do with it? Uh, it can consume a lot of resources, obviously, uh, if you're doing a GPU. And then it has to be for tolerant because if you're doing it over the cluster and something goes wrong, what do you do then, right? You, you won't be able to recover from it. And so the way the Raytune gives you that ability, it's got three strategies, right? One is exhaustive search. The other one is using Bayesian optimization to make sure that, that the trials that are run are, are good ones. And then the advanced scheduling where you actually use the scheduler that I actually talked about earlier. And so in exhaustive search, um, it's pretty easy to implement because exhaustive search is, is you go through a fixed amount of parameters and you can actually parallelize those. Uh, the only problem is that it's very inefficient because there's no way for you to know whether the previous trial was good or not because the fact that you know you have no idea how the previous trial went, you just go through the bad configuration. So that's that's um, a bit uh, a bit lot of work. And the random search is the same thing. You actually uniformly goes through through a combination across the linear space of those random search, and you can actually do that. So that's sort of exhaustive search uh, for small data sets and for if you're running it on a single node, that actually works. Uh, the second one is Bayesian optimization, where you actually um, look for many trials and it's sequential in manner whereby you only do the trials which are promising. In other words, if the previous trial ran a little more, then you're actually going to build on that. So if you look at this particular plot over here, the, the, the diagram in the blue are the trials which are going to be favored for, you, for them to run into completion. The other ones are going to be tossed out because you know, they, they didn't return any good results. Yeah, obviously, the, the problem is that this is sequential. And the reason it's sequential is because I need the results of the previous trial to ensure that the, the next one that I'm going to schedule is, is going to be a good one. Now, recent literature actually has uh, published, suggests that some of these are, are, can be done in parallel. So you don't have, you're not dependent on doing the, um, the sequential one. And the last and the most efficient one is what we call early stopping. And what early stopping allows you to do is that it's based on what they call successive algorithms where you start a bunch of trials and then at each subsequent run, you just drop the ones which are not going to do well. They're not meeting your metrics. They're not converging. So you just drop them. And then this gives you the ability to do two things. One is that you actually have a large hyperparameter space and you can go through all of these and the ones which are not performing well, you just drop them. And then eventually you will come to a place where you actually have a good conversions and you can actually use those. And those are the schedulers like ASHA and BHPO, and those are actually uh, the, the schedulers who actually uh, use this particular successful algorithm. And so how does, the, um, <clears throat> how does that work with, with hyperparameter tuning? It's very simple, three steps, right? With hyperparameter tuning, you create a function, your training function that's going to be the, the objective function that you're trying to minimize. Um, you, you, you go through the epochs and all that. Um, you're going to compute your loss and you're going to always report the convergence back to the tune so it knows now how, how did this particular trial run. You define your config space, which is your hyperparameter space you do, number of samples, and you define the scheduler and your algorithm that you want. And here I can say, okay, I want ASHA uh, to do my asynchronous uh, halving algorithm as a scheduler, and I'm going to use Optiumna as my search algorithms. And those are very easy to plug in. So the list of all the algorithms I gave you, 15 plus all state of the art, you can actually just use that with just declaration. That gives a very simple way of doing that. How does it do that? It's very simple. What it will do is tune will actually go in and create 
um, uh, 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 the main worker, which will now uh, distribute the training function across all that. Uh, and it's going to launch all these workers as actors, and it's going to start running those trials. And along the way, it's going to report all the metrics back in a distributed manner. So, the, so that way, the tracker or the optimizer or the orchestrator can say, do I really want to do the next one? And then this actually continues doing it um, uh, successively. And if there's an early stop that I need to do, it's going to go ahead and report, uh, stop that, um, launch a new trial. And if, if, if trials fail because one of the workers is, is down, I'm going to go ahead and restore that from the checkpoint and then start running the, the, the stuff again. So that's sort of you know, ray train as an idea. I don't think we actually have time to go to the XG boost, uh, but I'm going to talk through the demo. I do have office hours after this, so if you want to you know, come and talk to me about this, we'll do that. So what I'm going to do is skip over this, but just give you an idea of XG boost ray is the drop in replacement for the XG boost ray. So if you actually want to train things in a distributed manner, uh, it uses the data parallel um, uh, notion of saying, I'm going to have a copy of, of, of the, the, the model across all my workers, and I'm going to use different data to actually train them and then report it back to the, the final model for that. That's what XGBoost Ray is all about. And uh, let me just uh, go to, how much time do we have, David? OK, good. I think this is a good point. So um, I'm not going to talk about the, the XGBoost Ray because they, there's a lot of slides over here. But just, just, just a brief mention, it actually uses this architecture, which is a distributed manner. And so the way it distributes um, and computes the gradients per feature, it uses rabbit or reduced tree to communicate all the radians for each and every feature that it has. Um, and then you actually have a training set, which is actually then passed over to, to, your, um, to your worker. And these are shards. And the, and the tracker actually keeps track of that. And it uses the, the communication protocol rabbit, which is the old uh, rabbit reduced. And if you're using GPUs, then you can use glue or you can use nickel to communicate uh, radians within the GPU. And then one of them is actually um, assigned as a rank zero uh, to, to be the, the, the main uh, uh, parameter server, and then it just keeps track of that. OK, so what we'll do is we'll just go, I'm, I'm not going to go through this because I don't think we have time. So it actually uses four torrents um, um, in, in XGBoost. So if you're actually using Cold Start, what it actually does that if, if your Ray worker is, is running and one of them actually fails, what happens over here is that the one that actually failed loads the particular data and everything starts. So that's sort of the Cold Start, right? That's, that's a very inefficient way. The more warm, non-elastic uh, non one is a Warm Start where you actually have all the workers running. One of them actually works. All the ones are paused. They are not training. They're paused, and, and the worker that actually failed just reads the data from its last checkpoint and then starts training again. And the last one, which is the more elastic one, which is uh, ray, uh, the ray, execute array supports, is the most efficient one, where what happens at this point, when the worker actually dies, what happens at this point is that all the other workers keep on training. They don't stop, right? They keep on training. The, 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 the failed worker loads the data back, and then that continues doing. So that essentially is the um, how this is done. What I really want to get into is the easy way you can actually use the simple API, right? You just need to change a couple of things if you're using XGBoost Ray. You just import those uh, parameters, XGBoost Ray. Uh, you array the data mix, which is the way to distribute your data across your uh, cluster. The Ray parameters are how you actually want to distribute this on the Ray cluster. And uh, those are the only three lines of code you need to change, and your old XGBoot Ray can now be run on a distributed manner. OK, uh, what I'm going to do is quick takeaways over here. Uh, as I said, distributed computing is, is, an, is, is, no, is a necessity now, and it's not going to be a, uh, it's going to be a norm. And our vision is to make distributed simple very simple. All you have to do is just use those parameters, and your Python functions can be actually done. OK, um, let's go to the demo here quickly. Ooh. We start the demo.
well, this is happening now in parallel in, in, in arranged fashion that's the distributed computing. Uh, any questions that I can I can ask while while things are the asynchronous thing is working. Yeah, go ahead. Good. How does Ray handle large data sets? When you talk about large data sets in terms of how it distributes it or how it actually handles in memory? Uh, both. When I was in Berkeley, I was running a lot of large data sets. Yeah. 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 So this was what? 0 0.8 version of Ray? Okay, yeah. So the most recent one, we actually made quite a bit, quite some improvements. And so, you know, how it actually handles the large data sets is, is is how much memory you have, obviously, because Ray data. We have we have introduced this new library called Ray data sets that allows us to shard this data into partitions, and these partitions are now going to be stored on the Ray Plasma store, right? So yes, it's still going to be stored on on the Ray Plasma store, and you're still obviously limited by 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 the physical memory, which is no different from say if you were using uh, Spark, right? Spark. Sure, but I mean, mm. uh, what I'm looking for from this example is yeah. that if you have a system that is running on a large data set, you're not going to have to store it on a large data set. Right? Yeah, I mean, the, you're going to have in a multi-tenant environment, yes, you're going to actually have have those contending issues. But I believe that would be no different from any other. Uh, Yes, there there is this notion I, I I talked about. If if there's not enough memory, what happened is that is that the old the, the old uh, object stores, which are still sitting there, um, they will be spilled over to the disk, and new data sets will be there. So there is a way to actually uh, preempt empt those. And this was something that was that was added recently. So if you have a large data set, right, that needs to be fit in memory, and the old old object stores, which the reference counts are actually gone down, they have expired their the cache, they'll be spilled over to the disk, right? To, yeah, it, it's much. Oh yes, oh yes. No, 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 no crash. Yes, it's written in C plus plus, so you won't see any code bumps. Yeah. So debug a little bit right now. I mean, we have the the dashboards that allow you to do that. You can actually. Um, um, I don't know if you've actually with Ray Summit. We are working on the distributed debugging where you can actually do the PDB, so you can attach the PDB to your worker. Um, if you actually wanted to do uh, debugging, you can actually run Ray in local mode and then just attach that on, on the cluster. So there are two ways to do that. One is we trying to make it more easier where you can actually use distributed debugging using PDB. The other one is you can actually run it in, in local mode. Okay, so the yes. Is there like a yeah. 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 Well, I think, I think we are still primitive uh, everywhere. I know it's a Spark has the same problem printf statements and log files. And dashboards actually help that. So um, yeah, we are we we are ways away. Anybody else? Are we doing with the video? We good? Oh, it's not showing on the projector. Okay, fine then. Um, we probably I'll just entertain more questions and I'll give you a demo in the office hours. And if you come to the office hours and watch the demo, I'll give you a red sticker. Not my T-shirt, but I'll give you a red sticker. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, when you discussed fault tolerance on one of the slides, yeah, uh, how is the checkpointing saved and, and restored? Yeah, the checkpoint checkpoint can be actually saved. Oh, okay. Oh, good. No, it's it's not showing on the. It's actually showing on my uh, on my confidence monitor. It's not showing on my real monitor. Anyway, what were you saying? Previous slides, you were you were talking about fault tolerance, mm -hmm. and you said that you know if one of the nodes crashed, right, right, it would right, restore. Right. How is the checkpointing actually saved and restored? So the checkpoint um, can be used. Checkpoint directory can be one of the paths to your to your tune parameter, and so you can actually have a local directory where it's checkpointed, or you can actually put it on S3, right? So depending on what what uh, cloud provider you're actually using, it's just the path that's that's writable, and you can checkpoint how often you actually want. You want checkpoint per epoch. You want checkpoint per, uh, uh, you know, uh, based on on the certain callbacks. So the certain callbacks associated with Ray Tune that you can say, well, this particular checkpoint, I want the frequency of this checkpoint to be done. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other going once, twice. All right. Well, thank you a lot. Um, sorry, I couldn't. Uh, we couldn't. We couldn't get the demo sorted out. But I have it on my laptop, 
So I'm having office hours after this. Uh, do stop by. And thank you very much for your attention.